Hi, I am Manuel Adrogué and I do classical taekwondo. Welcome to episode 3 of the 9 videos that comprise our Korean kicking project. You will find very precise technical and cultural information that hopefully will improve your practice and understanding of the martial arts. You can check out our website for more information on this project. Please leave your comments below, I will be checking and answering them. Since this series is pre-recorded, I will be selecting the topics on which you show more interest and probably I will be adding a new chapter after the series addressing those matters. I recommend that you watch the previous videos and in particular episode number 3 is a kind of second part of number 2. So check that out before getting into this one. In this episode I will be addressing the technical details that come from the historical aspects I mentioned in the last episode. So if you are passionate about kicking, get yourself a good drink, sit down and enjoy. These are the contents of episode number 3. First, what is personal style, school style and organization style when it comes to martial arts? Second, the technical explanation on how Koreans modified or substituted the preceding kicks. Third, an example using the roundhouse or turning kick and how it differs from its predecessor and successor. Then we will be comparing Taekwondo and Tang Sudo's kicks with Hapkido's and Taekyeon's. Then a comment on the kicks found in Taekwondo forms or patterns. And finally the conclusions. In today's martial arts, the word style generally identifies either a martial art itself, for example Taekwondo as opposed to Kung Fu or Karate, or a variety within one martial art, for example ITF versus WT or Shorin Ryu Karate versus Wado Ryu. The so-called Karate styles started in Japan in the early 20th century when students identified themselves with their teacher's methods. So it was natural to say I do karate and I follow my teacher's style. Toyama Kanken thought that all karate was essentially the same in purpose and techniques and therefore he opposed the idea of styles because differences in personal views among specialists should benefit and not cause divisions in the art. Toyama was using Okinawan forms and ideas as a guide. He added the Kung Fu he learned during some years in Taiwan and kept an open-minded approach to make up his own karate. Toyama said his style would finish the day he died because style is personal. 50 years later Bruce Lee said that through proper training people should find their own personal style. Anyway, institutional styles do exist and also have good things to offer. People join gathered by common interests. If you really want to understand a master's perspective, you need to be exposed to his teachings for several years. A Ryu is a martial art branch that carries the perspective of a certain master on what and how to practice for best results. Then students condense those ideas and methods and that information becomes a school style. So one way to see it is that the Ryu is a collection of ideas and methods of a teacher while school style refers to the external shape of movements which concerns people very much these days. At a certain point, once you have gained enough exposure to the methods of one school, for your personal growth as a martial artist, you would probably benefit more by being exposed to other methods or ideas. 
when you go to elementary school, you start by having just one teacher, and that is a very natural thing. But as you progress to higher knowledge, such as high school or university, you are exposed to 20 or more different teachers with diverse ideas, specialties, and perspectives. So I understand Toyama's concerns against rigidly following one style or uniformity. At the 1970s and 80s, martial arts organizations started to become global, and they needed to provide identification symbols and to choose their sets of forms, particular uniforms and sparring rules for the branding of their organizational style. Within one organization, if it is expanded much, you will normally find instructors with different goals and training regimes. So, in practice, there may be several martial arts conceptions like mini rules within one organization. But leaders will not care what are the instructors' martial arts methods or ideas as long as the external shape of their motions is respected. A unified style in the execution of techniques is expected. As I mentioned before, it is frequent to see Taekwondo instructors to mix kicks belonging to Korean Karate with others from Olympic sparring, although both types of kicks were developed with a different logic and movement conception. This brings a lot of confusion. This project is based at one particular point in the development of kicks, which is what I call the golden era of Korean kicking, and that is classical taekwondo. I mean, we are not using Korean karate and we are not going too forward to Olympic taekwondo. In my experience, when I refer to classical taekwondo, the description also fits Tang Soo Do, since at the golden era, taekwondo and Tang Soo Do kicking were identical. So, to make a very clear point, we will be going through the differences between Korean Karate and Classical Taekwondo stages of kicking. First, Korean Karate was brought from Japan to Korea in 1940s, while the Classical Taekwondo kicks were developed in Korea during the 1950s and 70s. Korean Karate and Japanese Karate kicks were used by karate pioneers in Japan and Korea under the names of Tang Soo Do, Kong Soo Do, or even Taekwondo, while the classical Taekwondo kicks were developed by second and third generation black belts in Korean Taekwondo, Tang Soo Do, and Hapkido, and they were typically used by instructors who were born after 1940. Another comparison is that Japanese and Korean karate kicks were inspired by Funakoshi Jigo or Yoshitaka, Egami Shigeru, and early Shotokan teachers, while Korean classical taekwondo kicks were perfected and influenced by military training, chest guard sparring, and hybridation or interbreeding with other Korean methods, mostly through Hapkido. Korean and Japanese karate initially included six kicks, and all such kicks may be pulled back after contact, while classical taekwondo kicks are numbered maybe 10 to 12 with variations, and they include pass-through kicks, such as a reverse round kick, the outward crescent kick, and the axe kick. A third point is that karate kicks worked mostly in medium range and had a front chest disposition when fighting to facilitate the use of the rear fist, while classical taekwondo demanded a sideways disposition for extended range of the kicks. In karate, there was limited pivot of the base foot and in the roundhouse kick and the side kick, the kicker's chest would face the opponent, while in the classical taekwondo version, the turning kick or round kick and the side kick, there's a full 180 degree rotation over the metatarsal base, which ensures reach and 
This results also in a special alignment of the torso and the kicking leg. If a martial artist with his right foot placed in the rear performs a right foot turning kick pivoting old style just 90 degree, his kick will be relatively short and wide with his chest facing to the target. When the Koreans extended the kicks by pivoting almost 180 degrees, they took their head forward and changed the alignment of the leg and torso. The earlier kicking model at left only covered the green area because spinning, which is represented by the pink area in the picture, would have implicated exposing the back of the head too long and too wide. So it is natural that Japanese karate did not use spinning until the Koreans changed the shape of the kicks. This new figure did not only increase reach, but made back spinning possible by following the model of a compass. If based on a circular normal rotation of a compass, you carry the point of the compass in one direction, you will get an elongated elliptical shape moving to that direction. When you're facing a kicker, his or her pivot of the base foot and the tilting of the axis towards you forward brings the ellipse that seems to be chasing you, making it very hard to escape. That effect was caused by the combination of pivoting the base foot and leaning into the target. So the extended version of the round and side kick triggered the idea of back spinning as a new alternative to the classic chest or ventral rotation. It duplicated kicking options, taking acceptable risk. This is what Park jong soo and other Korean kicking pioneers were experimenting on during their competition days. Backspinning is referred by Koreans as Tui Dora or Mom Dolio Chagi, which is the kicking technique itself. In karate, Korean karate or Japanese karate, kicks are mostly performed with the rear foot and in the classical taekwondo version, in addition to the rear foot, the forward foot is frequently used. In old karate, there were no spinning kicks, while in classical taekwondo, there's an extensive use of back spinning kicks. In the old karate, kicks had a supporting role assisting fighting moves, primarily using the hands. In the classical taekwondo, kicking became as important as striking with the hands. In old karate, the round kick or turning kick would use the metatarsal base called the ball of the foot, while in the golden era of Korean kicking, the round kick uses the instep for improved alignment and reach, and the kicks with the ball of a foot are still used but mostly for self-defense or breaking, but rarely against a trained fighter. Finally, in karate, jumping kicks were not used at sparring, while in classical taekwondo, jump spinning kicks are an important part of the fighter's toolbox. Now, in karate, the distinction was being made between snapping kicks and thrusting kicks, while in Korean kicking, that distinction when training became irrelevant and was not used. In karate, the kicking leg's knee was deemed very important. There was a bending of the knee emphasized, while in the Korean version, the kick is released only half bent and pivoting and alignment of the hip and trunk are considered more important than knee action. In karate, attention to fast withdrawal of the kicking foot was emphasized on the idea that you needed to prevent it from being grabbed. In classical Korean kicking, emphasis on power and speed on delivery, not withdrawal, was stressed. It is the victim who should be concerned about being kicked and not the kicker who should be worried about the kicking leg being grabbed. In karate kicks, the idea of no contact was addressed at least to the point of withdrawing the kick, while Koreans who were concerned with contact and they wanted to make contact 
they did not insist on withdrawing much their kicks, although their kicks are expected to do a whip-like motion, so to some extent classical Korean kicking remains as an intermediate form between completely snapping back as in old karate and passing through as in Thai boxing round kicks. In Korean karate kicks, the side kick moves slightly upward in a bowl-shaped curve with a line of sight slightly over the chest, while in golden era Korean kicks, the side kick moves up in a dome-shaped curve and the line of sight is over the shoulder. The knee is chambered high, which helps to perform consecutive kicks. In old karate, the stepping in side kick crosses the non-kicking foot at the front, probably inspired by Naihanchi or Teki Kata, while in golden era Korean version, stepping in side kick crosses the non-kicking foot at the back for natural extended alignment. In the older karate style, the supporting leg was slightly bent and then the body and the head were kept a little bit crouched, while in the Korean version the supporting leg is fully extended and the head is held high up for a lighter sensation and mobility. Although I insist on the advantages of the kicking method achieved at the Korean Golden Era, the early karate kicking style, when correctly performed, is very good and suitable for their context. I have trained with older Korean grandmasters whose kicking style was of the early days. All my respect and gratitude to them and to those who encouraged their students to go beyond their teachers' achievements. In this graphic comparison of the round or turning kick, I show the three different eras. Please look at the direction where the base foot is pointing, the orientation of the shoulder line, and the angle formed by the torso and the kicking leg, and of course the reach of the kick. The picture shows from left to right the models for the round kicks of the early Korean Karate era, the classical Taekwondo era, and the Olympic era. The Korean Karate kick is short, the base foot is pivoted only 90 degrees or 110 at the most and thus the chest faces the opponent. It impacts clearly from the side with the metatarsal base. It works well at medium distance. See the yellow alignment lines of the shoulders and thigh and how the buttocks protrude. The knee of the kicking leg does not cross the green center line. The classical taekwondo turning kick version is longer because the foot is pivoted over the metatarsal ball from 150 degrees to 180, thus taking the whole body and head closer to the target. The base leg is also extended and the body adopts an almost sideways position with the chest facing slightly forward. The instep makes contact and the knee of the kicking leg slightly crosses the center line upon impact. The trajectory of the leg is not as wide as the first model, but it is elongated further for reaching. Thanks to the alignment and depending on the angle of impact, the forward motion of the body enhances power. The Olympic Taekwondo diagonal kick is conceptually similar to the Golden Era kick with a comparable final position, but it is semi-direct and shorter. The base foot is turned between 90 degrees and 120. The head is held back. The alignment of the torso and leg is reasonably good for Korean standards. The instep makes impact and the kicking leg's knee slightly crosses the center line upon impact. If you look at the next pictures, you will see from left to right the Japanese karate 1950s and 60s standard, the Korean karate standard, and at the right, the two classical Korean era standard, either with the ball of the foot, which is a specialized technique I will explain later, or the regular instep round kick at the far right. Note that 
in both two at the right, the buttocks are not protruding and the hip has continued forward in line with the target and the knee. As we have seen, classical taekwondo is built over the ideas of power, speed and proper structure. The straight punch, chumok chirugi, particularly the reverse punch, was the most important technique in Korean karate and helped to establish the identity of taekwondo as a martial art that is blunt, essentially direct, with strikes that are strong enough to break a rib cage, a skull, or whatever is put in front of the taekwondo practitioner. Actually, the thrusting punch is arguably still the most important technical tool in classical taekwondo, along with the side kick and the knife hand. In classical taekwondo, we train our fist as our main fighting tool, and it is rightly displayed in the patches of the different Tang Soo Do and Taekwondo organizations. That direct and pragmatic view of combat explains why Koreans loved testing their power by breaking solid objects, applying body mass into the target, improving alignment and increasing acceleration upon impact were significant concerns from the early Taekwondo teachers. The type of sparring that they chose long distance, sideways, reinforced these ideas and affected and changed the pre-existing ways of kicking. Now, many of you may have heard about Taekyeon. Although Taekyeon, which is an indigenous Korean martial art, was considered almost extinct until the 1970s, it was successfully brought back to life based on the knowledge of two of its remaining practitioners, Son Duk Ki and Shin Han Song. Against the frequent misconception that states that Taekwondo comes from Taekyeon, some acid commentators have pointed out that since those that helped in the restoring of Taekyeon were also Taekwondo black belts, it is said that Taekyeon actually comes from Taekwondo. So there's a paradox in their cause and effect chain, which to some extent is like a dog chasing its tail. Before it was reborn, Taekyeon certainly had an influence over Taekwondo. I will get to that later. And Taekwondo provided second and third generation black belts who participated into Taekyeon being reborn. I will get to that in the last video of the series. There are plenty of differences in the kicking of Taekyeon and classical Taekwondo because the heavy Korean Karate heritage and its linear conception cannot be denied. Taekyeon became part of traditional Korean folk culture which includes acrobatics such as jumping over a seesaw, dancing over a high tight rope or several men galloping over a horse, all performed at the beat of music. In that context, Taekyeon was simultaneously a festival game and a method to keep training Korea's men for irregular militias. When at the early 20th century, Japanese occupation adopted a brutally repressive nature, Taekyeon almost disappeared from the public sight and could not be found but in remote areas inaccessible to the Japanese. The excuse of innocent amusement and dance disguising guerrilla combat training is part of a fascinating parallel with Brazil's extraordinary kicking art, capoeira. I am not a Taekyeon or Hapkido practitioner, but I have been exposed to them to be able to make at least an initial comment. As I have been shown, Taekyeon kicks do not use blunt force and in principle they are not as strong as those of classical Taekwondo. They are what is called high kinetic energy strikes usually semicircular, relaxed and fluid. They work as attacks to inflict pain or sweep or trap the opponent's legs or hit the torso in pushing or tripping actions. Taekyeon does not use the metatarsal base as a primary tool of contact and it is practiced wearing shoes. Its head kicks, many times passing through and only few of them spinning, aim to strike the opponent at angles that will off-balance the opponent to the floor. 
The kicking ideologies of Taekyeon are Taekwondo are different in the sense that a Taekwondo expert would probably prefer to strike a well-rooted opponent for a perpendicular solid strike so that the opponent receives the full power as if he were a stack of wooden boards. The idea is to use speed and a straight line to shatter the hardness of the objective. On the contrary, the Taekyeon master will usually employ rhythmic stepping, floating and bouncing steps or unexpected jumps to position in a more favorable angle, looking for the point of least resistance and kick the opponent to push him off or to the ground in an effortless, graceful manner with a kick to the chest or head or touching inside the knee. Taekwondo is used in sudden bursts of attack offbeat while Taekyeon uses a cadence and many times it is trained with music. I would say that in general terms Taekwondo is philosophically yang and Taekyeon is um or yin. The understanding of rhythm, the lightness in the center of gravity by using the knees as spring have been identified as one of the essential features of Korean martial arts and that blended naturally with the way karate was changing when it came into Korea. Now let's go to the Hapkido kicks. They are usually attributed to the second generation Korean masters who built and expanded on the Taekyong kicks learned by Ji Han Jae and Lee Ju Bang. Hapkido kicks took a nastier tone than Taekyong's but continued the fluid whip-like nature. Hapkido kicks do not intend to unbalance but to cause damage. Hapkido furthered the use of spinning and other extended kicks, sometimes lowering the head and even laying the hands over the floor for additional support. This is different to the erect nature of classical taekwondo in which kicks are kept with an upright body to provide a stronger clashing structure and the possibility of combining kicks with karate type of punches and knife hands. Just look at the pictures I'm showing with Donald Kim as a performer. Hapkido kicks are defined by the area which they attack, the side of the neck, the throat, the armpit, the knee, shin and ankle are some of their favorite and quite unusual targets. The part of the foot also identifies the kick and the effect intended, which can be stomping, slashing with the blade of the foot, slapping or smashing. The shape and function of Hapkido kicks is very different from Karate, Tang Soo Do or Taekwondo. The classical front kick with the ball of the foot is rarely used in Hapkido. Instead, a piercing extended kick to the side of the pubis with the toes and the instep twisted outward is preferred. In their exchange during the 60s, the early Taekwondo, which was coming out of Korean Karate, absorbed some of Hapkido's kicking ideas. And Hapkido also introduced linear kicks to their program from their members who had Taekwondo or Tang Soo Do training. Most of the currently existing Taekwondo forms were made up during the 1960s to replace Karate Kata in Korea. The classical name of forms in Korea is Hyong. Later, the Kuki Won decided to call them Pumse, and the ITF during the 1980s switched to call them by a uniquely Korean word, Tul, which means pattern. The first 20 ITF patterns were created between 1955 and 64 by General Choi and his associates Nam Tae Hee and Han Cha Kyo, who had Chung Do Gwan background. These forms included front, side, turning and the twisted kick, although the kicking style was that of the early age, with short snapping front kicks and obliquely oriented turning kicks with the metatarsal base. At that time, 
the two rival groups were Choice Group, mostly involved in developing military taekwondo, and the civilian schools controlled by the Korea Taekwondo Association. Between 1965 and 1967, the Korea Taekwondo Association set up a commission headed by Pak Heman, who designed the eight Palge forms for color belts and eight black belt forms. In those Pumse, similarly to the ITF Ulji pattern, the stepping sidekick is done with the preparatory foot crossing over the front, as it is done in Japanese Karate. Since the prior Korea Taekwondo Association Commission did not have Mudokwan and Jidokwan representatives, in 1972 an expanded KTA Commission replaced Palge forms with the new Teguk Pumse and the new version of Koryo. KTA forms did not include round kicks but had front kicks directed to the face and a spinning side kick in Pyongwon Pumse. Now I will share interesting information never published before. As Kuki Won black belts know, Chung Kwon Pumse was designed containing a spectacular jump with a 360 spinning crescent kick slapping the palm. It is a kick not used by Koreans when sparring and it is not found in karate. You will be surprised where it came from. If you look at Pyongwon and check for the preceding and subsequent motions to the kick, which are a side punch and a head block, I mean I'm looking at the whole sequence and not the kick itself, it is evident that it was borrowed from an earlier well-known form of prying mantis long fist kung fu that it was taught in Seoul's Chinatown. That form is called Xiao Hu Yan, also called So Ho Yun in Korean. I will get to the kung fu factor in the last episode. At this point I want to credit James Thedos, my friend, who provided me the clues to make this connection. Going back to the development of Korean forms, it was a common intention to add more kicks. So in 1968, General Choi, assisted by Cho Sang-min, Kim Jong-chan, Park Jong-soo and Lee Byung-moo, added the last four patterns to his program. Those were Wiam, Moon Moo, Yonggae, and Sosan, which included newer kicks. The final touch in the ITF curriculum was a replacement of Kodang by Juche in 1981. Juche means self reliance and is actually the motto of the North Korean regime, a country that takes pride on being self sufficient. Juche pattern is considered a deference by General Choi to North Korea, which at that point provided support from the, for the ITF. Juche is a pattern that is considered the most difficult in ITF Taekwondo given its complex kicks, such as a slow motion spinning kick and a double scissors jumping kick. Pak Jung Tae is credited as having a major role in the design of Juche pattern. It is noteworthy that neither ITF nor Cookie One forms include passing through spinning reverse round kicks. Let me pass three technical details in ITF forms kicks. In ITF patterns, the preparatory guard for side kicks is called bending stance, which is also a product of the early days. And now it stresses the bouncing quality of ITF technique as a kicker coils down before raising up for launching the kick. If the kicking knee and the foot are properly positioned and the torso is correctly oriented, such stance is fully compatible with the best of Korea's kicking technology. A second comment is about the position of the hand during the side kicks in Taekwondo tool. Many times you will see the following mistake even performed by great champions, which is that the arm is extended in parallel to the kicking leg. 
the arm should not be parallel to the leg, but actually they should converge at a distant point. If the arm and leg are parallel, the body will be leaning far too much and the kick will have a deficient structure. Look at this picture from the ITF encyclopedia for a properly executed side kick with an extended fist. There's another mistake also related to this movement. The fist should follow a corkscrew pattern exactly the same way of a basic straight punch and not simply straightening the arm as if doing a sideways hammer fist. Both the side kick and the punch do a corkscrew motion revolving into the target as a bullet does in the barrel of a gun. That is one of the reasons why General Choi used the bending stance and it is a particular note of ITF sidekicks according to volume 4 of the encyclopedia. A third observation. I have seen in ITF forms championships that there is a trend of bending the supporting leg while doing the front snap kicks. This prevents the kick from making a powerful impact because the weight is sunk in the wrong leg instead of being applied in the kick with the kicking leg into the target. The sine wave is an image and the technical resource proposed by the ITF to use the knees and bouncing for natural and powerful motions. An exaggerate or inadequate use of the sine wave actually goes against that conception's goals. On a more general level, in connection with the Korean way of kicking, Taekwondo organizations have used their forms to convey some ideas on kicking, but they have not gone officially further than that. If you liked this video, I will share more information on history in episode number 5 and particularly number 9, so stay tuned about that. In connection with this video, there are two conclusions to draw. The first is that not all Taekwondo kicks follow the same conception, methods and goals. There are objective reasons to state that the kicking method of the golden era or classical Taekwondo represents the best kicking skills of Korean martial arts. I will follow a more practical approach to its training in the next videos. The second conclusion is that fully pivoted, extended and aligned kicks are best developed and tested in contact sparring scenarios. That kind of technique is adopted wherever good kicking is necessary for fighting, as it occurred in Korea, where there were additional favorable elements that made it come to existence, but also in Thailand and in France. The United States was a martial arts melting pot during the 1970s and the American sport karate circuit fighters from all styles adopted the forward foot and spinning kicks of the Korean method. Just remember how Joe Lewis, the most dangerous fighter in those days, was a black belt karateka trained in Okinawa who adopted the stepping in sidekick as his most recognized combat tool. It is open-minded study copying the good things in others and critical thinking what will make each of us improve in all areas in life. I hope you liked this video. In that case, please comment, subscribe and share. I will be checking for your feedback. The next episode will be following soon. And remember, as martial artists, we have the obligation to keep up with our training for a strong body, a wise mind and a caring heart. Take care.